Well, welcome to our program this evening. It's a privilege and honor to introduce Mark Tvezkov to you this evening. I have known Mark for just about, boy, I guess my marker for everything is, do you remember um, the pandemic? <laughs> we knew each other before that point. We served on the state historic advisory committee for historic preservation together for about five or six years. Um, he has been involved in working with us at the Maxville town site. He wrote our National Register for Historic Preservation, which our site is now listed on um, the National Register, as well as that building that we just restored on site. And this moment right now really witnesses the next chapter of what we do here. So the idea of taking what we've heard so far through journals and through um, telling oral history, um, what has been written before we came to Maxville and started doing this work, and bringing science in, bringing pe pedestrian surveys, bringing the tools in and the people that know how to interpret that space, and using science to tell the story this American narrative in a more inclusive way and telling it in a way that we can see prehistoric what was at the site and to see what has happened up to now. So right now, this moment, we're all creating history, right? We're in this space and we're get, getting together in our community and talking with one another. Well, what we get to have from that is a richer, viewpoint, a richer look into people and their their lived experiences in Maxville. Now Maxville, remember, was a segregated town in that space. And a lot of those folks came from the same region, but systemically had a lot of differences about them. So I don't want to steal any thunder. I want you to help me welcome Mark Tvezkov. And of course, we're grateful for the opportunity to work with uh, Gwen and Maxwell Heritage Center on this extremely important project, um, this almost unique project, one of the most significant uh, projects in historic preservation in the Pacific Northwest, the untold story of African-American loggers in, in the Pacific Northwest. And something Gwen just said really resonated with me about the that we're making history being right here. And uh, one of the things I love about the Maxville project and how I like to <clears throat> do my work is to think of it as um, a community effort. And I'm an archeologist and people have different ideas about archeology span in their, in, in their, in, in their heads. And the idea of doing the archeology span of 20th century logging doesn't, isn't always at the top of the list. And five, 10, 20 years ago, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. And this is uh, in a timely conversation. And even 20 years ago, the strength of archeology span was to tell stories that hadn't been told before. And it's very much an act of community building. And the idea of, of everyone, um, everyone showing up here tonight and having this conversation is very gratifying and in fact, part of the process. Now, the subject of the talk is the archaeology of Maxville, Oregon. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room already know a, a fair amount about the story of Maxville, a segregated logging town from the early 20th century, part of the great boom of, of timber harvesting in the Pacific Northwest that lasted from about 1880 to 1920. And uh, these are images from Maxville Heritage Center showing uh, Maxville in its heyday, uh, a, a posed picture of, of black and white loggers with their tools of trade. The Maxville baseball team on the upper right, uh, on the lower left are the railroad houses that, they, that Bowman Hicks, the lumber company, brought to the site. And of course, Maxville was made possible 
by innovations in narrow gauge, um, tight radius railroading that allowed the uh, high the relief topography of northeastern Oregon to be harvested. Um, as a matter of basic chronology to, to sort of set the stage for Maxville, and this is something I put together to help my understanding, uh, in 1880s, there was a rapid expansion of logging into northeastern Oregon. This was a product of the development of the ports of Portland and um, Tacoma, Seattle, and the railroad lines across the continent. And as I said, the innovation in, in uh, narrow gauge uh, railroading. In 1922, the area drew the attention of many uh, national corporations, including the Bowman Hicks Company of Missouri. And they had been operating in the American South from Arizona to, I guess, to as far east as Georgia. And they saw, and at that time, the great stands of timber in the American South and the Great Lakes region had been uh, depleted. So this was an opening and new market, and Bowman Hicks took advantage of it. They established the company town of Maxville in 1922 and built the town the following year. By 1933, their work was mostly done and they literally pulled up the tracks and left. They took the modular housing and, and abandoned the town as a corporate um, industrial concern. But of course, Maxville was uh, not abandoned. Many of the families that made Maxville their home uh, remained there in some of the buildings that were there and maintained a presence in Maxville until the mid 1940s when a uh, was uh, when the town was largely abound, abandoned from a, a major snowstorm. Fast forward to 2008, and thanks to the efforts of Gwen, Maxwell Heritage Interpretive Center was established, uh, a heritage organization led by the descendants of the people that lived in the site, which is a wonderful thing. By 1922, is that date right? 19, uh, I mean, 2022? Yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Maxwell property was obtained by the museum uh, for the purpose of historic preservation, public interpretation, and a lot of other uh, really forward-looking themes. And that's about when my work began, because once you have a land that is dedicated to this kind of cause, it's important to understand a lot of things about it, including its the, the footprint of material things on the on the grounds um, by night just it still is 2024 isn't it yeah earlier this year we nominated and placed maxville on the national register of historic places and again that's just a, a basic chronology so the when you write a national register nomination when you embark on archaeological investigations of a site you have to develop interpretive themes ideas uh, ways to talk about the site what might be important for the public, for scholars, for people visiting the site, for the future interpretation of the site. And I know, having been involved with Maxville, that that is a, there's a lot of different perspectives. We have people associated with Maxville who are ethnomusicologists who think about music. We have artists, we have writers, astronomers, people who go up there and do interpretive dances. Yeah, uh, uh, visits by uh, different uh, universities. And that's awesome. It's like, to me, again, that kind of celebratory, participatory, making history through engagement. Uh, Gwen emphasized the science of this, and I am indeed a science, but to me, that's one voice in a chorus of different perspectives engaging it. But the themes, to, for me, as an archaeologist, is include uh, a couple of things that are on the screen here. Uh, people didn't just go into the woods and start cutting down trees in mass out of nowhere. And a company in St. Louis, Missouri didn't invest all this money in railroad and infrastructure and people for no, re for no reason. This was the expansion of the industrial revolution. It was a period of rapid industrialization. The image on the upper right shows how rapidly railroads spread across the, um, the, the nation in that time. And the mechanization of industrial capitalism landed on the Pacific Northwest in a big way after about 1880s, precipitating what the scholar Adams called the greatest harvest of timber the world has ever known. In thinking about how to think about Maxville, one of the 
enduring ideas about logging in our local history is thinking about the enduring way of life of timber harvesting in the Pacific Northwest. As an archaeologist, I've excavated sites that are 13,000 years old. The Industrial Revolution, the industrial harvesting of the woodlands is a blink of an eye. It started in 1880, and the golden age of it was over by the 1930s, like a 30-year period of time. But it's remembered as this grand, enduring, and cornerstone of our identity. And that's the ideology and history of it. The reality of it was very quick, very intense, and it resulted in the denuding of old growth forest across the Pacific Northwest. And it was industrialized and commercialized on a global scale. Uh, comparing to something like um, mining, like the idea of an individual person uh, plying their craft mining that didn't exist the i like timber occurred in the context of large corporations and large companies <coughs> and as a major driver of society in that time the actions of these very powerful corporations reproduced social and cultural facets of the larger society which included in this case jim crow segregation the People and organizations and structures that had tremendous power by the act of doing the things they did oftentimes reproduce the powers that be within society. And that's a way to think about the establishment, uh, um, the timber industry in Oregon and the establishment of, of company towns like Maxville. Uh, the archaeology of things like the timber industry is, is new in archaeology. You know, most people associate archaeology with pyramids and the Mayans or something like that. But there actually is a vibrant in, um, um, field of industrial archaeology. And archaeologists working in the American Southeast have coined this phrase as a scholar named Holbrook. And I found this very useful to think about Maxville, that it's a factory without a roof, that... If you think of a factory in a big city that's stamping out gold watches or brass watches or something, it has all this infrastructure and in a, in a boss's office and an assembly line floor, and it has energy consumption and waste and, and rail lines. Maxville, this beautiful meadow and forest up there today, was that. It just didn't have a roof, right? Um, as a social scientist, thinking about how to consider a place like Maxville you know, we have some wonderful museums dedicated to logging in Oregon. There's one at Collier State Park down near Klamath Falls. And this is a quote from a, a scholar who studied a logging town in near Santa Cruz that was uh, staffed by many Latino loggers in a, in a very analogous way as Maxville. And he said, the study of the timber industry would be exasperatingly boring if we cling solely to descriptions of steam donkey engines and the application of steam power. In other words... Us archaeologists are nerds. We like technology. We will talk about steam donkeys and saws and everything else technological, but we have to do better than that. We have to talk about the social relations behind them, how they got there, the, the structures of power, the identities of people, and how we remember them. We have to move on. I mean, go to Collier State Park, learn about what a steam donkey is, but we got to contextualize it within broader sort of social things locally and more broadly. And in the case of Maxville, when Maxville was established, uh, Oregon still had some of the most extreme exclusion laws on the book. It was literally illegal to be African American in the state of Oregon in, until 1926, until that law was passed. This was um, a state characterized by some of the most extreme forms of Jim Crow segregation. And in the case of uh, when I was writing the National Register nomination, um, um, an architectural historian gave me this article by this fellow named Wyeth, and he talked about how, say, plantation houses in the in the American South, you know, this analogous industrial machine, used architecture to enforce segregation and the to sort of use the materiality of architecture and space to enforce unequal power relations of racial segregation and things like that, and to think about space and how it tacitly enforces segregation and social inequality and, dis and distance between people and dehumanizing of people, which is, uh, has an, sort of an extreme context in the, in the context of industrial spaces. 
And then finally, uh, this is a, a subject that I've considered in the history of Oregon in other contexts, is the idea of historical memory. This image on the upper right, uh, I believe, is in front of the logging museum in Myrtle Point. Yes, that's correct. And to me, it's a, this statue of this sort of Paul Bunyan-like character. And, you know, if you say logging, one of the classic memes or tropes of that is Paul Bunyan, uh, a often gigantic white man with an ax. And how do you, you know, how do we remember the past and what stories are ignored in the past? And the Paul Bunyan trope, I'm oversimplifying this a bit, of course, but the, it, it says it was the rugged individualism of white men that drove back the frontiers and created civilization in the Pacific Northwest. How many things in that sentence that I just said are not true, right? And how many of the subtleties of that story have been erased over, over time? It was not a white endeavor. It was a Latino endeavor, a Chinese endeavor, a black endeavor, a white endeavor, a Greek and Italian. So many immigrants came to the woodlands dislocated by uh, capitalism and brought here as dehumanized machines to work the woods in this corporate uh, structure, right? And when in that sort of stereotypical historical memory, when recalled at all, uh, the labor of African Americans or Latinos or Chinese are often denigrated as like this kind of faceless mass labor, dragging rocks down the mountain to create a railroad or something. When in fact, in the case of Maxville, uh, Bowman Hicks brought their laborers, including their black laborers to Oregon because they were skilled. They knew what they were doing after, from generations of working the woods in the American Southeast. So the point being is that part of the purpose of archeology span in the uh, place like Maxville is to sort of challenge these historical tropes, these historical memories that erase these other kinds of stories. Okay. All right, so now to the task at hand. I've been working with uh, Rory Becker from Eastern Oregon University, and we've been given three years ago, the technical task of trying to organize the spatial distribution of stuff in that beautiful piece of woodland up there in Maxville. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our method. You know, for historical archeology, span you know, we have the advantage of being able to take advantage of the tools of history, of cultural anthropology, of, of a whole bunch of different disciplines. And in the case of Maxville, we had this amazing head start through the oral histories and written histories collected by Maxwell Heritage and Interpretive Center. And as sort of assembled in this, what we call a memory map drawn by Eugene Hayes, which I, I'm sure a lot of the locals are familiar with his work. And this is an amazing piece of art right here. And this compiles what people remember about Maxville, its physical layout, where different people were. And it includes, I don't, do I have a cursor? Oh no. I'm not gonna risk that, but it shows different neighborhoods. It shows where white families lived. It showed the industrial center of Maxville. It showed the dam and holding pond for their logs, the railroad infrastructure. And way up in the corner, it shows on the upper right, it says the black log cutters um, houses. So it shows that segregation. It shows the, the black kids school and the white kids school, this, the segregation in terms of, of, of uh, education there. It shows the baseball field. And Elliot, you want to stand up and model the shirt? The Maxville baseball team uh, was a principal part of those oral histories. And if I got the story straight, it, they, had a set, they had two, a black team and a white team that played together when they played other communities. And again, if I have the story correct, Maxville was the biggest town in Wallowa County at its height. Point being is we get this information as archaeologists and it's filled with these incredible uh, and beautiful truths about social life in Maxville, but it's not scientific, it's not cartographically accurate, and that was our job is to figure that out. So Rory and I got to work, we went back to Maxville, this is Rory's slide, and we, for example, uh, found a time series of aerial photography going back to 1946 and 1947 of the Maxville site. And that was right about the time when that snowstorm destroyed um, the most of the houses. And the 1946 uh, and 1947 aerial photos show structures on the ground 
that that we could use to consider where the different neighborhoods in Maxville were. And we can compare that to the time series of photographs coming up through the 1970s and understand how the landscape changed as logging practices changed and land use at Maxville changed. We also engaged our students and volunteers in a systematic, uh, what we call in archeology, span a pedestrian survey of that landscape. These are images of that. And this is uh, our students recording one of the collapsed structures at Maxville. This is a railroad grade at Maxville. You can see where the railroad ties were pulled out when Bowman Hicks abandoned the site. Uh, and that allowed us to trace the railroad lines. And this was a burned down building at Maxville. There's artifacts all over the surface there. And the point here is that we spent a couple of years documenting surface scatters of ceramics, glass, metal, and moving them around in uh, geographic information systems software to try to identify these different places at Maxville. Uh, I, I'm, I tell this story a lot because I, I just do that. Um, but it's a cliche for archaeologists when someone finds out you're an archaeologist to say, what's the coolest thing you've ever found? And I always talk about, we talk about stories and culture and whatnot, but I haven't answered that question now because the baseball diamond was, the location of it was unknown, but I did when we got the 1946 aerial photo, you could see the baseball diamond clear as day. So actually this right there in the, in the left. And so the coolest thing I've ever found as an archeologist is the baseball diamond at Maxville. One of the point, and there's Rory, uh, he couldn't be here tonight because unlike me, he's getting ready for the upcoming school year. And he's a geophysicist as an archeologist. And part of this kind of survey work is doing magnetometer and ground penetrating radar surveys of sections of the ground. And this is an example of that, where we take that aerial photo information, the results of pedestrian survey, and do some subsurface geophysical research to map out features underneath the ground. And the summary of all that is that we have now, not a complete, but a pretty good idea of the different facets of the um, factory without a roof, where the different parts of it were, where the different neighborhoods were. We of course know where the superintendent's lodge is and still is today, but where the, where the hotel is, where the white residences were, uh, the, the black loggers houses remained a little bit more elusive and required more work. But these are, these are different kinds of artifacts from different parts of the site. The upper right is the log holding pond and dam that is still there. Underneath that is the cutoff water tower for the locomotives in the industrial center. And the bottom left is a telegraph. There was an elaborate telegraph water and sewer system throughout Maxville, and we're busy mapping that. And of course, these scatters of different kinds of ceramics, including mass produced uh, industrial kinds of things like that green banded ware on the bottom right of that picture. And then fancier ceramic types like these uh, transfer, transfer printed, uh, blue, blue transfer printed wares up there. We also use artifacts like that to date the little archeological deposits. For example, the brick in the bottom uh, middle is, has a maker's mark of the Washington Brick Company of Spokane. And there are guides that show um, when, that style of maker's mark existed and it's the 1920s, right? To when the peak of Bowman Hicks. And in the middle center, I love those artifacts. Those are from what we think is the um, Maxville Hotel and their toys, uh, marble and a toy tea set. And we have found evidence of children across Maxville. And again, that's a way to tell stories that aren't commonly told in the sense that a factory, an industrial factory with families living there, um, raising their kids, um, interacting with each other and, and playing. Uh, the archeology span of children is actually very a, a common theme in many, um, many archeological studies. So, and the last thing I wanna talk about is the work that we've been doing the last two weeks. After having documented much of the Maxville site, uh, Rory and I, uh, and Gwen decided that it was time to actually do some excavation, having some fairly good idea of where one of the white families lived. And thanks to Rory's geophysical research where one of the black families lived, we conducted some limited excavations over the last two weeks. The white families built in permanently constructed houses with plumbing, 
uh, um, timber construction. And th this is a, a representation of what one of those houses would have looked like. And this is what it looks like today. This is a drone photo from just two days ago. It shows our excavations and the fallen timber over that house. And we did some limited excavation there. Um, that's Lorian and Nevaeh. Did they come tonight? No, uh, they were uh, locals and volunteered on the project. And this is our process. We excavated a few uh, small test holes. And that included artifacts dating to the 1920s. These are three sets of uh, apothecary bottles that we found in those excavations. They're graduated and they would have been used to hold uh, medicines. And this is where we begin to be able to think about the daily lives of the different people at Maxville. There's a remarkable absence of alcohol bottles across Maxville. Even I've excavated many historical archaeological sites. And they're always, even during Prohibition, there's whiskey bottles and brandy bottles everywhere. But it's in the excavations and the surface survey, it's, it's kind of a remarkable absence. So this, and again, these artifacts come from the context of a white family's house in the 1920s. Um, the, the work they do is reflected in that assemblage. Uh, railroad spike on the right, uh, file there. This is a, th the thing on the left is a uh, suspender buckle from a brand called Hickory that has a little kid playing with a dog on it and it has a date of 1907 stamped on the back of it. And we found many, many aspects of clothing, of industrial clothing, rivets from jeans and things like that. Um, the house, so work, I was taking some of these pictures literally just before you all got here. And that house had, and this goes to the reflection of segregated space. The constructed house for the White family had a crystal doorknob, right? That's what that is on the left. And it was archaeologically found right at the front of the house. Um, more, and also the people that lived in that house, and you can see this stuff right there on that tray. That's the construct, that's a refitted, uh, how do you say that word, compote? Like a press glass. It was a fancy piece of glassware that that family brought with them up into, up to Maxville. They also had some pretty fancy ceramics. These are all from this uh, white family's house. The, they had hand-painted Japanese ceramics on, on the left. That's more of that press glass material on the right. Um, the inevitable creepy porcelain doll. <laughs> um, and any guesses on the object on the upper right? Not a ruler? What? Yeah, it's part of a harmonica. <laughs> Which brings us to music at Maxville, which uh, my colleague Kelly is really interested in. And that's one of a couple of different hints of the music produced at Maxville that we have, that harmonica part. And these are more artifacts from the White family's house, uh, of outline for a watch, little copper embossments. And again, we're literally just finishing this work. So I'm taking these pictures on the fly and we'll have eventually have more to say about them as we identify the maker's marks and such. That circular iron thing on the left is probably a buckle for a purse, a woman's, uh, well, that was kind of sexist thing to say, but a, like a handbag of some kind. And of course, that's an example of the rivet there on the bottom right. And we had, again, many rivets from rugged uh, dungarees. Um, the other project, the other part of the site that we went after this time were the so-called black log cutters homes. To my knowledge, this is the only known photograph of that neighborhood at Maxville. And you can see the railroad cars. Uh, these are portable houses taken off of railroad flat cars placed there for the duration of the Bowman Hicks tenure. Um, that is the Bishop Creek floodplain there. And it took us a long time. There's a concept in social science called intersectional intersectionality, right? and how different factors intersect to reinforce social inequality, for example, or racism, for example. And to me, there's a really powerful example of that because it extends not only to the lived experience of the black families themselves who lived literally across the tracks. And as we've came to learn, they lived downstream from the outlets to the sewer pipes in the less healthy part of town, enforced Jim Crow segregation. But yet another kind of intersectionality of it is the idea that uh, almost anybody could walk out to Maxville and say, that's a house right there where somebody lived. And that house is a white family's house. 
But the black families, their houses are, are also erased by the physical configuration of how they were arrayed in prefab, industrialized, portable, dehumanized housing um, that didn't leave like their very presence. And these were, I don't know how many families for 10 years, they left, they had just as big a life as the white families, but their very materiality of their existence took us a lot more to get at, right? And that's been one of the most rewarding things about this particular project, because thanks to Rory's ge geophysical work, we were able to do this excavation right on top of a deposit of domestic debris from one of the black loggers house. This picture we took, I think this morning um, in the rain. And this is an exposure of animal bone, like butchered deer, Canadian geese and duck. There's also tin cans there. We think Prince Albert tobacco cans. I won't do the joke, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and also on the bottom right, you see the remains of a collapsed uh, wood stove. And uh, we think that this was right next to one of those railroad cars and there's lots of timber bits and nails to suggest that they had constructed an addition to that house that was left behind when the railroad card was taken away. And in a lot of ways, um, that deposit, these are more pictures of our excavations. And uh, we know that this, and I should have said this for the other house as well, yeah, we're, <laughs> this was a cool artifact that came out this morning, but it, it was important in the, con it's an 1887 Indian head penny, right? And one of the ways that we were able to date these deposits is there was a sequence of pennies at this, at this particular uh, deposit from 1887 to 1922, you know, and penny and coins get curated for a while, but that spray of, of coins with that, those dates place it right in the Bowman Hicks era of Maxville. And not only that, but then we have other bottles and ceramic things in there that also point to that date. But yeah, that was a fun moment. These are uh, artifacts from the Black Loggers home. More of the rivets. We have Levi Strauss uh, rivets. And then we all enjoyed this one, the Boss of the Road, which is apparently a brand of, of denim, and that, of workers' denim that was used in that era. On the right, again, pop quiz, what's that? Yeah, it's a jingle bell from the harness of a draft horse. And we found three of those, two of those. At least and when it came out of the ground, there was a rock in it and it still jingled. Yeah, that was fun. And again, the daily, so industrial, the, the material of their daily work lives, but also the, of their daily personal lives and family lives and social lives. Uh, there is a series of 100-year-old diaper pins <laughs> in the site, uh, which to me is like one of the most visceral artifacts, um, of the idea of a mother changing or a father changing their children's diapers in that space, surrounded by you know, burned out sardine and kerosene cans, but having this like int like real intimate family life was really evocative to me. And on the right is a, I'm trying to remember my, my grandmother had them. There were these like porcelain European figurines, right? And that one is stamped Germany. Um, and that's the base of one of those little uh, decorative figurines that was in that house. And we found other parts of it as well. Uh, in the middle of that, uh, and again, in this idea of living your life in the face of this kind of industrialized, uh, segregated life were other parts of their lives. These are beads on the left. We've been thinking about what they might be from. We were thinking maybe uh, like a lampshade, but they didn't have electricity. So maybe it was for a purse, like a 1920s purse, or even like embellishment on like a dress. And we don't know that this is exactly the case, but it, all our minds went to like flapper dresses from the 1920s. And there are, there are oral histories about uh, dances to that 1920s style music. And speaking to music, um, on the right are fragments of vinyl records that we found in the Black Loggers house. And it's gonna be my mission to find the music that's on those vinyl records, to excavate music out of the ground uh, from the Black Loggers houses at Maxville. All right. <laughs> so again, uh, this, this presentation might be a little thematically truncated because that's the how we've sort of thought about Maxville as archeologists. We we're working on identifying the different places 
at Maxville. Uh, we're trying to tell stories of people whose stories have not been sufficiently told in the history of Oregon, including their role in the industrialization of the Pacific Northwest woodlands and the way that families live their daily lives against that structure of Jim Crow segregation. And that this, we're just completing our first uh, two weeks of excavation in that. On, in that. And so the last thing that I'll say is to thank my hearty crew, uh, many of my current and former students and uh, everyone else who's helped and volunteered on the project. And Gwen, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.